Edutrainment Workshops, the insurance industry's leading education and training platform presents Life Insurance, the entry-level series, the products, the underwriting, and the planning applications to position your practice as the premier provider of insurance products in your community. Get on board, get on track, get to where you're going. And now, your Edutrainer, National Insurance Columnist, Steve Savant. Well, welcome everyone. I'm Steve Savant, your Edutrainer and coach. In our introduction into annuities using our Edutrainment workshops. And this week, we're talking about annuity income scenarios. And we're gonna be using SPIAs, we're gonna be using SPDAs, combination annuities, and index annuities to try to drive retirement income. Remember, one of the big premises of using annuities is always thinking about how I'm going to take income. It's really not meant to just stay in your portfolio and then transfer it to the next generation. So we're really looking for it as an income play. And remember, if you haven't seen our front end of our teaching, you need to go back to the workshops that start at day one because we really lay a foundation and a good cornerstone in your thinking on how annuity works. We give a little history. So I recommend that if you're seeing this for the first time today, go back to the original. Uh, workshops and just go ahead and, and uh, start watching those first in sequence. The chronology will really help your tutorial purpose. Now, also, if you say, Steve, I don't know where those are. I just picked this up off the web. You can always hop onto our site, www.brokersalliance.com. As soon as you come to the front page, just hit our on-demand video section and all our edutainment workshops are there, including our daily internet talk show, The Business Insurance Zone, and my opinion piece on the weekend called Welcome to the Weekend with Steve Savant. Well, let's get into it today. I want to talk again about annuities and about the lifetime income. Now some of these will be 10 years certain, 20 years certain. We might talk about lifetime income. We might talk about a time period certain. But whatever we talk about, we're going to be using the word income. And some people like to use the word distribution. Maybe some kind of the phrase, the kind of street phrase. How about withdrawals? But remember, all those may have tax consequences. So I just want to use the generic income scenario. Some of this, of course, everything we're going to be talking about all this week is predicated generally on non-qualified annuities. Now, if you are taking constructive receipt of regular qualified annuities, you need to match that up, especially when you hit 70 and a half, that your actual RMDs, your required minimum distributions, match up to your SPIA or however you're generating income off your annuity, whether indexed or SPDA. So just make a heads up. But everything we're going to be talking about pretty much is going to be non-qualified annuities. Now, before I can do this, and surprisingly enough, I harp on this a lot when we do math, uh, when we're trying to figure out what equations work best. Should I do at a general, general SPIA? Should I annuitize an SPDA? Should I 1035 it over for an index play and use the indexed income? All these things are really good questions, but the first thing I have to do is I have to determine what kind of timeline my client has. And to start out with that, I want to go to the Mondo board now and show you a couple docs that you can order, by the way, absolutely free at the biz at brokersalliance.com. That's T-H-E-B-I-Z at brokersalliance.com. We're looking at the 2001 CSO mortality tables on the number of people who die each year by age and by gender. So it's per thousand. For example, let's say we're dealing with retirement income and generally we're gonna be looking at people 55 and older for our basic teaching today. So if I went over to the male section and I pulled age 55, only 6.17 males will die per thousand in the population. And so I'm looking at that's pretty low for a 55 year old and women it's even less, it's 5.1. But as you start moving up the geriatric line to age 60, and I never thought I'd ever think that 60 is the demarcation line on geriatric, but since I've arrived, I guess I have to talk, talk that way and salute the flag to the ARP nation. I'm sitting at age 60 and now it goes up, it almost doubles in my per thousand rate, isn't that, yeah, that's so interesting to me. That's 9.86 per thousand of population that will actually die during that time. And then women are at about 8.1. When I start to get what we call traditional age or traditional retirement age at age 65, 16.8% of those living per thousand will die on the male side of that equation. On the female side, there starts to become a small there, there's a pull away number now. So there's a difference and that spreads now becoming somewhat significant. It's 11.8 out of a thousand for females at age 65. When I get to age 70, 25% 
of all those per thousand, 25% of per thousand are going to be alive or actually die, and then 17% for females. When you get up around the age 80, now we're starting to get closer to the life expectancy on the 2001 CSO tables. When you look at that, that's 70.1% of males per thousand are going to be sitting there. They're not going to be here according to the tables. And then lastly, look at the number on women at 80. It's not half, but it's really down. It's only 43% per thousand that are going to be, uh, that are going to die that year. Now, when you start to get into the later years, you'll notice that the 100 percentile on males is between the 83rd and 84th year. And the 100 percent uh, for females on the 2001 CSO is somewhere around age 87 to 88. Remember, I'm only talking about the standard tables. So we're looking at the per thousand rate of deaths at any age. And again, if you want this, you can order it at the biz at brokersalliance.com. Now, why do I even bring this up? Because you need to figure out a good idea, at least a basic idea of life expectancy. And many times I'll use a part two on a life app to determine what kind of income stream I'm going to generate, whether I'm going to use a SPIA or annuitize off a SPDA or 1035 it into an index or try to plan with an index and using the index writer. All this matters to me and it's all based on these timelines. So I want to be able to establish some basic ideas. Now what I want to do is I want to go to the next chart and show you the 2001 CSO, the actual tables we build products on. Now the last chart I gave you was the actual deaths per thousand on the 2001 CSO mortality tables. This is the average life expectancy on the 2001 CSO tables. And just let's look at this. So for example, going back to my beginning of 55, when you start getting your senior discounts and everything, around age 55, there's about a, you're going to add another 24.7 years onto a 55 year old male at the standard non-smoking table. So if I'm looking at 24.7 and the, and at that age, women have about a 28.2 additional years on top of that. But as we start going up the scale, an age 60 year old male today has a standard expectancy of another 20 years to age 80 and female at that same age is now at 84. When you start to look at age 70, there's another 13. If you've actually lived to age 70, they add on another 13 years. So they think, well, a 70 year old that our expectation at the standard tables is now at 83 and a female is at 86.4. So you can see once you make it past a certain age, they start to kind of give you a little bit more numbers because you're actually making it for certain reasons. Remember, human longevity is a huge issue with family history and your health and all these things matter. We're just reflecting on the standard table so that we can figure out what's the best economic deal. And the only way I can do that is to try to give a good estimate on what I think the client's lifetime or life expectancy is going to be. Now, when we get way out here into age 85, even there's there's not that many but if you live to age 85 the odds are you might live another five years as a male and another seven years and remember keep in mind that this is the standard table what's really amazing is once we started looking at the 2008 value-based tables from the society of actuaries we started looking at their relative risk tables and those tables were even farther out than this so when I start to look at and try to quantify where my client's going to lay out, I do look at this as a boilerplate. And again, you can order it at the biz at brokersalliance.com. We'll send it to you. But I'm really looking at the Society of Actuaries, which you can go out and read it if you're really in, into insomnia. This would be a good time to read that. It's a big brief. But they got some nice tables out there based on the 2008, over a million point, I think it's a million point four uh, people that they did this on survey to get the statistics up to see what kind of numbers they have and that's what I'm looking at now is what's my timeline because if without that I don't really know which is the better deal I have to look at that line now keep in mind that when I'm talking about standard tables that's one thing and I'm looking at the 2008 BBT standard tables that's another thing what happens when the client is preferred or the clients preferred plus or even better when the clients super preferred my timelines are going to be longer than these numbers. 
So if I look at a female, 60, super preferred, great shape, a baby boomer that's taking care of herself, she's been doing all the right dietary issues, exercise, she has good family history. When I start to look at this, I know I better start looking at at least age 90 to 95 on a super preferred. And I start marking to mark that number, again, using kind of additional or adding on as I cross over preferred, preferred plus, and super preferred, start adding on to the 2001 CSO, or in my case, I like to use the 2008 VBT tables, and I start adding on to those numbers and saying, this is a reasonable timeline. Now think about this conversely. If you're going to go ahead and say, but my client actually is not only is my client not standard, but my client has medical issues. My question is always, are those issues or those medical items, are they mortality or are they morbidity? And if they're morbidity, do they lead to mortality numbers? And what I can do then is say, if my timeline is going to be shorter because I have a less than stellar or a less than standard expectation, life expectation, I'm going to go ahead and say, since it's shorter, I'm going to start looking for annuity companies, and there are some out there that actually will incorporate the medical condition of the client. And if the timeline is shorter, the benefits can actually go up. So it's interesting to keep all this in mind. For your preferred, super preferred, or your preferred, preferred plus and super preferred, there's a whole timeline and a whole way of thinking at this and approaching it. For people that are less than standard, there's another whole set of ideas that you want to incorporate into your thinking. When I'm talking about income, I'm talking about how long will my client le live so that I can establish is there economic viability, does the math work? Especially in this low interest rate environment with annuities, Remember, the interest rate's not driving it right now, the mortality is. If interest rates start to tick up, I think you're gonna see SPIAs and different forms of annuity income are gonna be huge. They're already big now, but I think it's gonna be unbelievable and quite significant if we get any kind of interest rate up. So the things we're talking about, everything we're talking about, the math we'll be speaking about, is all based on today's low, probably the lowest environment since I've been in this business almost 30 years. So it's interesting to keep in mind that when you're talking about this, you're talking about income. And I wanna be able to say, what's the health of my client? Because it'll determine the actual payout and the benefits and how long I'll receive those benefits. When we talk about lifetime expectancy, think about it. The Guinness Book of World Records, I think she died at 122. We have several women that are all in their 100 teens, so they're over 110. It's unbelievable to think that Willard Scott says, happy birthday to a handful of Americans that turn 100 every day. And if he took the time to say happy birthday to everyone that turned 100, it would take him 90 minutes a day, 24-7, 365 days a year. So think about it. The longer I can stretch these numbers and guarantee lifetime payout, those numbers become extraordinary. If my timeline's short, I want to look at carriers that actually add additional issues like medical underwriting. Now, heads up, as I said at the front end of our workshop today, most of what we're going to be talking about is going to be non-qualified. And when I think about non-qualified, I have to incorporate, especially if we do any kind of lifetime payout, is my, is my qualified money or my non-qualified money, I'm going to have this exclusion ratio. At the beginning of our class, we talked in the 1982s on back, we used to do this thing called last in and first out, where we got to take our basis out. But then they changed the rules in August of 82, and now it's first in, first out. So our earnings are going to be taxed first, and we don't capture basis many times till later. But the exclusion ratio in a life payout of some scenario is going to give me an exclusion. And that means that part of that is a return of my basis day one. Part basis, part return of gain. That can have huge tax advantages because remember, when we go to file, that's actual income that's placed on our 1040, but part of that will be excluded because of basis. So the exclusion ratio can be really great, especially when you consider that all of our income ultimately could be on the provisional income test for Social Security. Keep in mind, the reason I bring this up is because if we have some of this that's excluded from tax, that means it will not be on our provisional income test because it's return of basis. 
If it's not taxed, then part of our Social Security will be reduced that much in the provisional income test, and that means our benefits won't be taxed as much. Now remember, the gain will be included, but the basis of this return. The exclusion ratio is generally measured from the time I take distributions to the time of my life expectancy. The more archaic and the more old that carriers use those kind of expectation tables, the better the benefit and a higher exclusion rate. If we ever get higher interest rates, that could really help us out right now. But think about that, non-qualified annuities and life scenarios, I want to look at the exclusion ratio and the taxable event to quantify that with my life expectancy for my client. This has been an edutrainment workshop, the educational division of the National Insurance Clearinghouse, the marketing arm of Brokers Alliance.